Please turn in the back of your Psalter hymnals to page 892. We're on Lord's Day 41. We're on the Seventh Commandment. And before we read it, the Seventh Commandment says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Very simple, straight-up commandment. We'll be looking at questions 108 and 109. First, 108, what is God's will for us in the Seventh Commandment? That God condemns all unchastity and that we should therefore detest it wholeheartedly and live decent and chaste lives within or outside of the holy state of marriage. Question 109, does God in this commandment forbid only such scandalous sins as adultery? We are temples of the Holy Spirit, body and soul, and God wants both to be kept clean and holy. That is why God forbids all unchaste actions, looks, talk, thoughts, or desires, and whatever may incite someone to them. The two texts for today are found in Matthew chapter 5. This particular segment of Matthew 5, 27 through 30, is exposition of the next to the last of the seven Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart. Just as the prior one fit uh, the last of the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, having to do with anger. So this one fits the one, blessed are the pure in heart, having to do with the seventh commandment. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Then the other text is uh, Romans chapter 1. We're kind of splicing into the midst of Paul's discourse here in Romans 1, but we're going to capture uh, what we uh, are focused on this morning, having to do with uh, impurity. So Romans 1, 24 through 28. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Let us pray. Your heavenly Father God, come and save us. Come and cleanse us. Come and secure us. In fidelity to yourself, in true love for our Creator, true love for our Redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ, true love for the Holy Spirit that so graciously changes us and applies Christ to us. Lord, open thy word to us this morning in a fresh and powerful way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Ten Commandments are delivered from our Creator, capital C. He is sovereign. He is holy. He is loving. He is infinitely wise. And He delivers those commandments to us, creatures, small case, 
see. We, in contrast to him, are weak, wayward, selfish, and ignorantly foolish. Now, if we can get that into our minds, <laughs> that contrast between our creator, our holy creator, and our unholy creature selves made in his image, if we can get this truth in mind, who God is and who we are before him, there'll be a lot less commandment breaking. <laughs> there'll be a lot less misery suffered because of our waywardness. A lot less deception and defilement. A lot more reasonable, sane stability and happiness in life. Probably nine out of ten cases where people have said, I've made a mess of my life, in some way involves the seventh commandment. And somehow it's that commandment has played a significant role in that conclusion. I made a mess of things. And yet there's this there's this simplicity to the seventh commandment. A, com a simplicity that is in contrast to the utter complexity and difficulty <coughs> that accrues when the commandment is violated, which is ironic. Complex messes coming out of such a simple violation of the command of God. And what seemed to be a good idea at the time, what seemed to be something that would be enriching and satisfying to the heart, exhilarating in the moment, wound up being demeaning, defiling, personally impoverishing, and heart break. This is what the book of Proverbs tells us about in Proverbs chapter 6. And if you read on from chapter 6, chapter 7 is actually a, a little story in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs doesn't have many stories. Proverbs is by and large a lot of axioms about life. But chapter 7 is a little story. A story about a young man that was led astray. But before we Go any further on this topic of the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Let us see if we can get a good tight definition of what we mean by adultery. So here goes. Adultery is the inflaming and then the indulging of sexual desire outside of the covenant of a male-female marriage. The inflaming, the indulging of sexual desire outside of the covenant of the male-female marriage. Now, if you think about it, it's a very simple circle. It's in that circle. It's good. Outside the circle, it's bad. In all simplicity. And that's a commandment not because God is a curmudgeon or wants to limit your personal pursuit of happiness as a good, full-blooded American, but he wants us to be safe. He wants us to reflect him in the beauty of what it means. And he wants us to pursue desires that are appropriate to our creatureliness that he has placed there in a righteous and loving manner for all involved. In the very beginning, Genesis chapter 2, wonderful text. After the six days of creation and the seventh day of rest, Genesis then zeroes back in upon the man and the woman. God created the man and the woman for intimacy. And then he created the institution of marriage for pursuing that intimacy, the, the arena in which that pursuit of intimacy would occur. 
He said it was not good. That's the first time. He, every time, he, every day of creation, it's good, it's good, it's good. In the end, it's very good. But now he says it's not good that the man is alone. There, there's still more to do than the creation of Adam and naming the animals. It's not good that he should be alone. I'll make him a helper corresponding to him. And therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. One flesh, Paul interprets in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, is the physical sexual union between a man and a woman. The two shall become one flesh. So clearly our bodies and our relationships are not up to us to conduct according to our own whim and will. Our bodies belong to Him. And therefore they are to be given to Him. They are to be given to Him first as our Creator. To rule over. To guide and direct. But they are also to be given to Him, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, to Christ as our Savior. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where he interprets that little phrase from Paul, he goes on to say that your bodies are not your own, but they have been purchased by the blood of Christ. They've been redeemed. They belong to him, rightly so, by redemption. And so all this rogue, autonomous pursuit of your own desires according to your own wisdom is out. Matter of fact, that, that, is, that is at the heart of, of the fallenness of our depraved hearts is this idea that we're cut off to do whatever we want and fulfill our desires according to our wisdom. It is contrary to the fact that we are creatures before our Creator. We are people redeemed and bought and paid for by Christ, whose lordship we should recognize in our lives. Our actions, our eyes, our ears, our words, our thoughts, our passions and desires are all to be brought under the authority of the word of our Creator and the lordship of Jesus Christ for our advancement, our enrichment, our deepening, our maturing in every way. And I realize when we take that stand, that puts us contrary to a lot in this world. It's like the, uh, it's like the fish trying to swim upstream. You really notice the ones swimming against stream. as the ones that are just floating down, going with the current. And it's because of that because of that resistance that Lot had in Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the, the citizens of Sodom said to him, Who made you judge over us? Well, <laughs> I'm just agreeing with God. You're not. <laughs> and you probably will hear that in your life if you follow Christ. Who made you judge? How did you become holier than thou? Or some other snarky comment. But God has called us, contrary to this dark world, awash in immorality and idolatry, to a life of chastity and purity as defined by the Word of God. And the Word of God forbids Adultery, and in forbidding adultery, it forbids fornication. Adultery is violating within, fornication is operating outside of that circle of marriage and safety. And it includes not only the, the, the reality that in the beginning God created Adam and Eve, He did not create Adam and Steve, it also, as Romans chapter 1 so clearly points out, show that homosexual relationships are distortions of the image of God and are a sinking deeper into darkness and sin because that very thing is against nature. Nature. You can look at the mechanisms of things and say, oh, this is how it works. 
There's certain physical characteristics of various things in life. This is how it works. You can look at the human body, a male and female, and you can conclude, oh, this is how it works. It's like a lock and a key. You've got your lock, you got your key, the key unlocks the lock. Oh, that's how they work. Two keys, two locks, it makes no sense. It's crazy. So not only is it contrary to the word of God, but it's contrary to nature itself. And so, Romans 1, Paul shows us that immorality is derivative from idolatry. Because, see, it's the worship and love of God that brings us into a place of self-control of regulating those desires in our lives. And it's when we turn from Him that we turn away to the fulfillment of false desires. Romans chapter 1. And so Jesus said, Matthew chapter 5, didn't He? Uh, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And again, and you, know, you have this opportunity, oh, well, yeah, I'm clear there, I never did that. Well, He says, if you look, if you look, if your eyes go in the wrong direction, to what? Satisfy a desire with the eyes. You've committed adultery in the heart. So not only action, but visualization and imagination are part and parcel of that precious beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's the heart that again is the heart of the matter. And so God not only forbids, thou shalt not commit adultery, but remember as we said about the commandments, there's also the flip side of the commandments, there's the positive side of the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt commit marriage. And if thou shalt not commit marriage, then you shall be committed to celibacy or singleness until that time. But that is the, the framework in which we operate within and that is how we should understand the meaning of the commandment it has its negative side but it has its positive side uh, as well well how do we avoid this particular sin how do we avoid adultery uh, i want to appeal to thomas watson uh, it's a wonderful book on the Ten Commandments by Thomas Watson, old good Puritan preacher. Back in the day when the English language was uh, very artfully employed. I want to read you seven of his antidotes to adultery. Number one, he says, Come not into the company of a whorish woman, avoid her house, as a seaman does a rock. Boat out on the sea, avoid the rocks. Right? Proverbs chapter 5, Come not nigh the house, the door, sorry, come not nigh the door of her house. He who would not have the plague must not come near infected houses. Her house has the plague in it. Number two, Look to your eyes, Watson says. Much sin comes in by the eye, having eyes full of adultery, 2 Peter 2.14. The eye tempts the fancy, that is the desire, and the fancy or the desire works upon the heart. A wanton, amorous eye may usher in sin. Eve first saw the tree of knowledge, and then she took. First she looked, and then she loved. The eye often sets the heart on fire. Thirdly, he says, look to your lips. Take heed of any unseemly word that may in enkindle unclean thoughts in yourselves or others. Psalmist says, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Fourthly, he says, look in a special manner to your heart. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart. Everyone has a tempter in his own bosom, 
Out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, Jesus said. Thinking of sin makes way for the act of sin. Suppress the first risings of sin in your heart. Suppress the first risings of sin in your heart. There are desires that are generated from our own fallen heart that must simply be suppressed. I know it might sound, well, that's not good Freudian psychology. Well, that, that may be. But it's good biblical sanctification. <laughs> you suppress those desires. You suppress them, they may be weakened. You don't feed them. Then he also says, beware of going to plays. A playhouse is often a preface to a whorehouse. Such sights are there that are not fit to be held with chaste eyes. We not frequently uh, talk about playhouses in our day and age, but we do have movies. And the, the advice applies to movies and what we watch. Take heed of lascivious books and pictures that provoke the lust. As the reading of the scripture stirs up love to God, so reading bad books stirs up the mind to wickedness. And then lastly, uh, uh, this is my favorite of all of his advice. To avoid fornication and adultery, let every man have a chaste, entire love to his own wife. When Solomon had dissuaded from strange women... He prescribed a remedy against it. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. The positive side. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. It's not having a wife, but loving a wife that makes a man live chastely. Not having, but loving makes a man live chastely. He who loves his wife, whom Solomon calls his fountain, will not go abroad to drink of muddy, poisoned waters. Pure conjugal love is a gift of God and comes from heaven. But the festal fire, it must be cherished that it go not out. The festal fire, the fire of the festival, the, the festival fire of, of the love relationship. He says it's got to be cherished that it does not go out. He who loves not his wife is the likeliest person to embrace the bosom of a stranger. Sagacious words here on avoiding adultery by our good man, Thomas Watson. I want to add a seventh. Watson doesn't mention it, but I think this is the all-inclusive all for avoiding adultery. One word. Fleet. Fleet. It was Joseph who tempted by Potiphar's wife. What did he do? He didn't hang around and say, well, let's talk this through. He fled. I'm out of here. And he ran away. David, when he was up on the roof seeing Bathsheba, did not flee, but was drawn in. And he fell. And so Paul tells his young protege, Timothy, what? 2 Timothy 2.22. One of these verses you should know. 2 Timothy 2.22. Flee youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, holiness, and peace with those who call upon the Lord with a pure heart. Pure-hearted friends will help you to be a pure-hearted man or a pure-hearted woman. Well, what if you haven't escaped? What if uh, all these antidotes to adultery has not worked and you are in the snare? Escaping the snare of adultery. How do you get out once you're caught? Now, we live in a day and age in which pornography comes from that Greek word, porneia, for fornication, pornography, pictures of things you should not be looking at are just awash 
When I was a kid, you had to go drum up a magazine somewhere, and you had to go look for it hard to get one. Now you just click on your computer, and bang, 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 it's there. What do you do if you're stuck in that? Well, first of all, apply the antidotes of Watson, number one. But number two, ramp up fervent prayer in your life. Ramp up fervent. Just look at the Psalms, how often the psalmist is crying out to God to deliver him from his enemies, from snares, from his sins. There's passionate prayer. Pray, O man. Pray, O woman, if you are caught there. Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, Fix your mind on things above. Not on things on the earth, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Seek Christ. Take in a daily fuel of the Word and of the and of prayer of the Spirit of Christ that will purify and sanctify and bring your heart up and out to begin to delight in the right things, the spiritual things. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, Walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So pursue that fervently in prayer. Ramp up fervent prayer. Two, repent. Heartfelt confession and repentance before such a hardness of heart sets in that you'll never escape. Proverbs 28, 13, he who covers his transgression shall not prosper. He who confesses and forsakes shall find compassion. And if needs be confessed, to some good friends. Brother, I'm stuck. Pray for me. James chapter 5 recommends that. Confess your sins to one another. Get help. So first, ramp up your prayer. Second, repent. Third, revitalize your faith in the cross of Jesus Christ. Revitalize your faith in the cross. Of, why? Because the cross of Christ Brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter what sin you're struggling with. This is just a specific application. But the cross of Jesus Christ is where we bring our sin for its killing and its cleansing. Vital that we exercise faith redemptively in Christ. And keep pumping the pump. You know, don't say, well, I asked Jesus to forgive me and cleanse me and I'm still stuck. No, keep pumping the pump with, with a, a revitalized stirring up to draw out from your high priesthood the fruit of His cross to your soul. Keep pumping the pump and get the waters of redemption for the cleansing and killing of sin by the cross of Christ. So ramp up prayer, repent, and, and revitalize a stirring up of your faith in Christ's cross. And again, I want to go back to Watson here because he just says it so wonderfully. And he ends, as a matter of fact, his exposition of the Seventh Commandment on this note. And I, and I bring this to you. To keep the soul pure, have recourse to the blood of Christ which is the fountain open for sin and uncleanness. Zechariah 13.1 A soul steeped in the briny tears of repentance and bathed in the blood of Christ is made pure. Isn't that a wonderful line? I'll read that to you again. A soul steeped in the briny tears of repentance and bathed in the blood of Christ is made pure. There it is. Pray much for a pureness of soul. Create in me a clean heart, O God, Psalm 51. Some pray for children, others for riches, but pray thou for soul purity. Say, Lord, though my body is kept pure, yet my soul is defiled. I pollute all I touch, O purge me with hyssop. Let Christ's blood sprinkle me. Let the Holy Ghost come upon me and anoint me. O oh, make me evangelically pure. That means uh, gospel pure, gospel, gospel gracious, graces. O oh, make me evangelically pure, that I may be translated to heaven and placed among the cherubims, where I shall be as holy as thou wouldest have me to be and as happy as I can desire to be. 
escape the snare if indeed you are there. And here are then some motives for avoiding and escaping adultery. Some mo- our motives, our motivation. Number one, to please God. To please God. Ephesians chapter 5. If you look at Ephesians chapter 5, the first half of Ephesians 5 is about purity. The second half is about marriage. Interesting, isn't it? But in the first half of Ephesians chapter 5, learning to walk as children of light contrary to the dark uh, impurities of this world, Paul said to now learn what is pleasing to God, seeking to please Him. That's the motivation. Lord, I want to please You. I don't want to please myself. I don't want to please my uh, wayward desires. I want to please You, O God. Number one motive. Number two, the motive of having a pure conscience. The desire to have a pure conscience. The joy of a clear conscience and desire refused rather than the ache of a bad conscience in desire refueled. Refuse the desire or refuel the desire? One's a good conscience, the other's a bad conscience. Seeking that pure conscience. Of course, a pure conscience, once it's defiled, praise God in Jesus Christ. If our conscience is defiled, we know where to go. To have it washed in the blood of Christ. And the third motive for avoiding and escaping this sin is personal, close relationship with Christ. The pursuit of a deepening communion with Christ, a communion that begins in this life and culminates in heaven. That's what it's all about, brothers and sisters, drawing near to Christ, communing with Him, enjoying knowing Him, being closer to Him in life, personal close relationship with Christ, a pure conscience, and pleasing God are the motives that will drive and carry you through, that will propel you into seeking purity of heart. And so the seventh commandment, ultimately, in the big redemptive scheme of things, the seventh commandment points us from the beauty and the love and the pleasure of earthly marriage to the beauty, the love, and pleasure of heavenly marriage. Because marriage is a meager type of a far greater reality. So you you have that perspective as a Christian. The world knows nothing of this. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, you know that marriage, as wonderful as it is in this life, is a meager passing type of a far greater permanent reality of the marriage of Jesus and his bride forever. And those two marriages, the earthly and the heavenly, are interconnected covenant fidelities that call us to purity of heart. It's Jesus Christ who is the second Adam, has loved his bride. He's laid down his life for her to bring her into eternal, pure union and communion of love with himself. And that, you see, that's our place of ultimate satisfaction. To know Christ. To be intimate with Christ. To prize the love of Christ. I like that little story from C.S. Lewis who stated that our problem is not fundamentally a problem of being stuck in our lusts. The problem of not seeing the greater reality of the largeness and satisfaction of the love of God. He says, it's our failure to see the wonder and the satisfaction that is brought to our souls because of His great love. We hold on to our, Lewis says, we hold on to our our mud pies and the backyard puddles. Why? Because we fail to see the vacation by the shore and the huge 
seaside. Failing to see the one, we settle for the other. So let us allow this seventh commandment, its very positive side, yes, it's, it's heavenly consummate side, in the union and communion of Jesus Christ with his bride in the marriage supper of the Lamb, a union and communion that begins even in this world. Let that hold and captivate our hearts. A love that is displayed in the cross. Praise God. The cross that not only kills and cleanses us of our sins, but the cross that also ignites our hearts in love reciprocally for Jesus Christ. For I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself for me. Let us pray.